at the Prancing Pony later for your unexpected gathering. I can turn that off from here. You gotta leave the volume up. So my, my younger son is a big Marvel fan and he dared me to use that music in my presentation this year. So um, uh, I said, I'll do you one better. I'll redesign my whole slide deck to look retro to fit it. So hope you don't mind a little disco in the afternoon. Um, so I'm gonna answer, um, uh, Gina didn't like my title, so I had to change it to just software quality anti-patterns in testing, but the real title is actually, all your QA is hate you. Um, and I'm gonna uh, answer that question, why uh, all your QA is hate you today. As long as answering two other very important questions I usually like to find out quickly, which is, who the hell am I and why are you here? Um, so my name's Keith, I've been working in testing for uh, 20 <laughs> years. And um, I work right now with Techmark Global Solutions. I run their testing practice, software quality practice, and I do a lot of management consulting with what I call enterprise IT organizations. And I've spoken and written a lot about uh, testing in enterprise IT, which is essentially um, the way I define it as businesses that build their own tech, but tech is not their primary business. Um, right now, I work with a lot of organizations, kind of big banks, uh, financial services, insurance companies, doing projects around kind of agile transitions, um, trying to develop pipelines for people, automation engineering, and as well, I personally get involved in a lot of test process improvement initiatives. So the reason why I'm giving this talk is that um, after all these years, I'm still seeing organizations suffer from the same problems. Um, despite all the uh, advancements that we've supposedly made in testing techniques and practices and tools. So I'm gonna talk through, uh, it uses, not really case studies, but uses examples, current projects that I'm working with uh, organizations right now to kind of illustrate the point of where I'm seeing those, those problems and uh, perpetuate it as well. Uh, the other issue is that I think there's actually a really good opportunity right now. Some of the tools have possibly caught up to uh, some good thinking around software testing, particularly around um, uh, AI, machine learning, and there's, there's a lot, there's a significant opportunity to improve the way we do things. Unfortunately, um, as an industry, we're probably gonna um, fuck it up. So um, I wanna offer my opinion on how we cannot do that, okay? So uh, that's where we're at, is everyone okay with that? Yeah. It doesn't matter, because I'm not <laughs> changing the presentation now. So. <laughs> For, don't worry, it won't do that every single time, just one. <laughs> that was the other challenge I had to incorporate that noise into a slide. So before I get too, star, too far into this, um, I just, I wouldn't be uh, doing him uh, a service, uh, though he needs nothing from me, but if you don't know who Jerry Weinberg is, um, he's an incredible, one of the true lions of the industry, and he passed away this year. Um, uh, amazing guy, he worked in the business for 50 odd years, he's written some amazing books, um, if you, I mean, it, it, prolific writer. Um, he was actually uh, kind of invented the term uh, software testing through his work on the Mercury project with uh, uh, NASA back, good grief, in the, in the 60s. Um, uh, my favorite books he's written is Psychology of uh, Computer Programming, Perfect Software, and other, other illusions about software testing, and a book I think if you haven't read, everyone should read regardless of what business you're in called uh, The Secrets of Consulting. He really kind of put people and empathy at the center of designs and system thinking. So I just, we don't, he, he passed on this year. I never, I interviewed him for my podcast. I never got the chance to meet him, but he's a, a lovely, lovely guy and I'll be sorely missed. So thank you, Jerry. Um, so now on to the more important stuff. Again, I'm showing my age a little bit here. So we need to journey deep into computer space. Um, we all know, that'll turn off in a second, don't worry. Um, <laughs> do we all know, we all know we, in, in software design and development, we talk a lot about um, patterns, right? It is gonna stop. <laughs> now. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is the fourth time I've given this talk, so I should know when it's gonna stop. Um, so we talk a lot about patterns in software development, and patterns are very useful for quickly solving problems or using them like heuristics to help us get to some solutions quickly, but also there's a, you know, an, an idea called an anti-pattern. Do you all know what an anti-pattern is? So 
one person straight. Thank you for shaking your head. Um, so an anti-pattern is kind of a common response to a, no, uh, a common problem that actually adds more dysfunction and it seems like it's a, an easy solution but actually kind of exacerbates or complicates the problem even more. Um, and so I want to talk through some of those anti-patterns that I've seen it, for software quality and how they relate to testing. So anti-patterns are extremely powerful, all right? And why are they so powerful? And, and I think some of the reasons have to do with psychology, and particularly in software testing, because we've got, you know, we go decades in software testing before any kind of real changes happen, and you see organizations make deep investments in these ideas and don't want to invalidate uh, their, their strategies by having to change their mind. Um, so the first one that I see a lot is people have what I, what's termed sunken cost bias where they're, we are going down, as, I, as the line from the movie, um, The Birdcage, we are gonna ride the insane horse towards the burning stable, right? So we've put our money into this tool and we are gonna buy it. You know, I think that's how you know, the ALM suite has kept around for so long, because you know, people just have so much investment in it that they're not gonna, not gonna change that, despite all its problems. And it, changing after the fact would mean they're throwing, they think they're throwing good money after bad. Um, the other uh, bias that I see in a play a lot of this with these organizations is, what is termed survivorship bias, which is, you know, there's a lot of change in these organizations and people bring ideas with them that they think made them successful where they were at. And so therefore, there must be something special about that idea, so let's redeploy it here. Now both those biases are pretty, pretty well uh, determined to be nonsense, but they're very powerful, right? So they, they, they give you the, uh, the idea that what you're doing is working. The other um, uh, problem with, with anti-patterns is they're primarily based around antidotal evidence, right? Um, and this is, you know, what antidotal evidence is, it's not collected through any kind of scientific means. It's really through kind of personal experience and your personal antidotes as opposed to anything that um, you could actually prove. Um, and, and those are so powerful because, you know, people love stories. You know, people buy, we were talking at the speaker's dinner last night, people buy stories. You know, they don't buy tools, they buy the story that is being sold around the, around the story. Um, and those narratives sell, you know, people want simple solutions to complicated problems, and that's what makes them extremely attractive. Um, and and I've, you know, I've rarely found um, in my travels organizations that want to address the cultural issues that are underpinning their quality problems, um, because that means they have to look at themselves, right? They have to look at how they do things, and to quote uh, you know, Jerry Weinberg, you know, there's always a problem, and there's, the problem is always people. Right, <laughs> so uh, but that that you know means management or leadership you know has to get beyond kind of caretaker uh, mind frames and 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 really try and change the way uh, some of these patterns are developing. I also deeply understand the irony of me getting up here and relating personal stories to try and prove a point. So if you were going to tweet, uh, hate tweet at me right now, that's I, I get that. Um, so let's go back further in time. <laughs> Has anyone that read this book? Well, I, I figured you, did you help co-author it, Mohinder? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Mohinder's a good friend of mine and he's been around for a while. Um, so a couple, couple people have read it. Um, so this book is The Art of Software Testing. It was written by Glenford Myers. Um, anyone know the year it was written? 1979, 1979. And the thing about this, this book is that it has, um, you know, regardless of how you feel about it, um, it has probably driven more and solidified more thinking on how software testing works in organizations than probably any other book that's been written since. And it, excuse me, introduced a couple ideas that just permeate everything we do now, right? And the first one being the idea of bugs, right? So I'm just gonna quote from the book right now and see if any of this rings familiar. So testing is the process of executing a program with the intent of finding errors, right? I, I, I don't know if there's any one more single thing 
that has done to kind of damage or commoditize or cheapen the software testing efforts, then that idea right there, that the entirety of your testing effort is to find errors, right? It's created this inordinate focus on bugs. Um, and in fact, again, at the speaker's dinner last night, we were having a chat about this, and the, the, the Agile community in some organizations has had such a, like, uh, toxic shock reaction to defects that they don't even want to look into it. Like if there was a problem, we don't track anything, we don't look into it. And, and even saying the word track, people are probably getting microaggressed a little bit, like feeling like a, you can't use the word track, you're trying to figure So even the idea of trying to find out where our problems are, the, the software testing world has been so bad at how we have this relationship to finding problems that the Agile community has kind of reacted to it and saying, look, we don't even, it's such a bad idea that it's rotten to its core, we don't even want to do anything about it. But that still permeates a lot of what we do now. The other thing that this book introduced was this idea of test cases, right? Before that, it wasn't really spoken of. So I'm gonna read from the book again, um, just to give you a taste of it, see if this sounds familiar. Um, an unsuccessful test case is one, the unsuccessful test case is one that causes a program to produce the correct results without finding any errors, <laughs> right? So what's happened since 1979, right? Test cases really are basically the primary unit of measurement of anything to do with software testing. And I, I challenge you to find me a vendor or a tool that in some way, shape, or form is not trying to boil it down to some kind of unit of measurement focused on, on test cases, right? And despite that, despite that, and my dear friends at QA Symphony hear, hear me uh, bang out about this all the time, um, despite that, there's really no useful purpose in counting test cases. But oh my God, do testers like to count shit, all right? Um, their only real use, right, is marketing, right? So that's where you see tool vendors talk about percentages of automation targets, right? Oh, we want, you know, 90% of our testing is automated. Well, how are you working that out? Because we've got test cases and, well, there's, uh, if you know who Michael Bolton is, you know, the tester, not the singer, um, you know, he talks a lot about when you say 90% of your testing, there are so many qualifiers that should be added on to it, things like, the test cases that we know that we can run, that we've written, that can be executed via an automation tool that, are, that can pass. That, there's so many things around that to build that 90%. But man, you know, C-level folks and buying managers eat that shit up, you know. Um, yeah, the defect leakage, right? That's all based around test cases. And I guarantee you now there's people out in the uh, lobby trying to delete their defect leakage stuff from their website right now so they don't have to go out there and Google it. Um, but those, two, those are some very powerful things that have still permeated our industry that drive tons of dysfunction through how we try and manage software testing. So the first anti-pattern I want to talk about is managing testing decreases its effectiveness for risk management. So I'll let that sink in for a second and give you some context. So there's a couple folks that have really influenced my thinking on this this year. And as, as usual, some of my friends in the industry are you know, kind of further along in some of these ideas. And I have to give them credit for it. One of them being a good friend of mine, uh, Martin Hinier. And he, they've talked a lot and worked with a guy named uh, Dave Snowden uh, around kind of managing uh, complexity and trying to understand complexity. And uh, as usual, when I hear about these things, my first idea is like, well, I didn't think of that, so I'm gonna outright reject it. Um, but then uh, as I've done my own studying and reading and kind of, you know, you pour enough water on a rock, eventually a groove will form. Um, so I started looking in a little bit, and there's a really good book I would uh, suggest you read. Um, it's called, It's Not Complicated, The Art and Science of Complexity for Business. Uh, a guy named Peter uh, Rojit, uh, uh, wrote it. And, um, the, the, the difference that he draws is that between complicated and complex, right? So complicated problems are hard to solve, but they're basically algorithmic, right? So they, they can be solved. They may be difficult to solve, but they, they can be solved. Complex problems 
are too difficult to solve. You only manage them, right? So there's too many variables. If you look at uh, failures in complex systems, there's too many variables and moving parts to be able to attribute it to one root cause. It's usually um, uh, systemic failures are usually uh, you know, kind of multivariate in nature in the, the origins of their, the, the, the fault. Um, and software testing, you know, is a complex problem. You know, testing in general is typically uh, uh, complex, but software testing specifically is, is complex. And responsible testing, you know, is really impossible with a complicated mindset that you're going to be able to solve managing testing, right? Um, there's a, and you can watch some videos he's made and also read some white papers written by a guy named Richard Cook about how uh, complex systems fail. And I, I've got, I've just, I've, I think I've got a, they're gonna hand out or email you like the references, so if you wanna you know, read them later, you can. Um, but the idea around you know, complex systems failing is that you can't accurately model the real world, right? We don't really understand it, you know? I mean, and I think, you know, you probably won't admit it, but if we use that as an analogy to our, our software systems, we don't really understand them completely either, right? How all the different permutations and, and how they're being used. Um, so it's, we only model them based on what we know, not how they're actually used and how they behave in the real world. So if you're managing testing, um, in a kind of traditional way, you're really focusing on the wrong things, right? So these are things like metrics, the mechanics of how testing works, all the numerical fallacies related to automated testing. Um, you know, those, those kind of, those structural uh, ideas we put in place actually decrease the ability for testing to give us what we want, which is usable, actionable information, right? But the, the roots of that are obviously you know, very, very deep. So we wanna think, kind of manage testing in a, in a complex way, but not solve it, right? Um, so I'm trying to kind of flip the script on that a little bit. The way I would try and manage, what we should be managing is risk, right? Threats to the business, um, realization of business value. That's one of the things I like about uh, Jess Humble's uh, continuous delivery book is they focus a lot on business value and tracking that to understand how from a, uh, an idea to revenue realization is a great way uh, to, to, to testing, for testing to help inform those ideas. Um, and so to give you an example of a client I'm currently working with right now, um, is that they, they are, I won't, I won't say names to you know, uh, hide, hide the guilty, but they're a very, very big company in the US to do a lot of transaction processing. And they're kind of new, sexy uh, transaction processing platform. You know, it's having a lot of problems uh, moving into the cloud, um, not being able to, you know, kind of really manage their pipeline. And so they brought in a guy who, um, you know, I think it's one of the, isn't it one of those, uh, the uh, a hallmark that if you have to bring in somebody who's kind of chief innovation officer, there's absolutely no innovation going on at your organization. Um, so they brought in this guy to help kind of re-energize and, and, and get where they want to go, which is faster delivery for the business. And so I sat down with this guy for a while and talked to him about different ideas about testing and things I'd observed while I was working with them. And he listened, you know, for a little bit. And then, have you all seen uh, The Music Man? No? Okay. Have you all seen The Simpsons where they put the monorail in? Yeah, okay, that's based off the music man, all right? So, yeah, and showing my age a little bit. But he just kind of said, like, Keith, when I stopped, he's like, Keith, you know, I've got two words for you, development factory, you know? And his whole idea was, his modern approach to doing this was, and he literally said, developers produce widgets, we just need them to produce more widgets. So we're gonna literally design this on the, the ideas behind manufacturing. I, and in my mind, I was thinking, you know, uh, after years of consulting, you don't say what actually, you try and build a little bit of a filter, you know, it was like good luck taking that, you know, job requirement out to the uh, market to attract top talent. We will go and work in a factory. Um, so the next uh, anti-pattern that I, that I see a lot is working to speed up testing actually slows it down. And I get this a lot where, um, you know, clients want to speed up testing, 
right? And I've, I've referenced you know, there's the same kind of report that comes out every year where people feel like, oh man, if I could just get rid of all these damn people, I could automate everything and I wouldn't have to have you know, anybody on my testing team. Um, and th there's been tons of investment in tooling, uh, engineering, um, marketing, all this stuff to, to give the perception that if you automate all your tests, things will go faster, right? Um, and I've reviewed hundreds of test automation frameworks, engineering efforts, and teams. Um, and I, and I've, I very rarely have seen any that could articulate the business process that the automation is working under or trying to validate. Um, you know, I very, very rarely have I actually had them answer the question, well, what would happen if we stopped running this? You know, people don't understand the, the automation that they're writing. Effort is very rarely factored into maintaining it on an ongoing basis. If you haven't seen Angie Jones talk about getting automation uh, included, uh, maintenance included in your definition of done, it's a great talk that she gives on how to do that. I think she's with a different company now, but she was an automation engineer with Twitter for a long time. Um, and again, the strategy primarily focus around counting test cases. You know, we've got how many test cases, let's write them, and, and sometimes if you've got a more mature pipeline, they just shift over to, you know, how much, uh, how, how many uh, functions or feature files have they automated and just start counting that instead of the actual test cases. So, um, my, in my opinion, and this is formed on a lot of, you know, my experience, if you want to do, uh, if you want testing to finish faster, do less of it. So say that with me. If you want, I'm not joking, if you want testing to finish faster, do less of it. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, the question you should be answering, if you is people work as test automation engineers here, who's using automation? Come on, everybody should be raising their hand. Somebody at some point is doing some level of automation, right? So the question you should be answering is, what is the minimum amount of tests that I can run to help manage risk? You know, I see too many engineers answering the only question of can, not should, right? Um, and so I would challenge you to go back and look at the, the strategy around the test automation doing, and can, it, can you answer that question? What is the minimum amount we need to do to accurately manage risk? And some tools I would use to do that is you know, kind of threat modeling, looking at your business and trying to understand what risks are associated to your business and how is the automation that I'm writing help manage that, right? Um, you know, understanding your test asset inventory, as I like to call it, trademark? No, uh, I should ring the bell for that. Um, but basically trying to understand what tests you have by asset class across your pipeline. I do this exercise a lot with clients when they're trying to speed up, is let's figure out what we have, particularly in enterprise organizations that have a lot of legacy um, you know, investment in test COEs, right? Testing center of excellence is where they're trying to go agile and they've got this giant offshore team and they want to, they can't really co-locate co people and they're running these giant test packs that they don't understand the structure or scope of. So let's, let's try and break that down a little bit and tuck point where we can reallocate some of those tests so that we're running them at, a, at the opportune time as opposed to where they've just been run traditionally. Um, the last bit of advice I'd give you on this is some serious grooming and just delete your tests, right? Say that with me too, delete your tests, right? <laughs> um, and, and I know that people are probably gonna heads explode or think I'm nuts, but there, there's a, you know, I, I think he's a bit of a, a, he's not a really nice guy, but um, there's a guy named Nassim Taleb. He's actually the only person in the world that's ever blocked me on Twitter, bizarre. <laughs> Um, and I'm not really even on Twitter anymore. But um, so he wrote this book called Black Swan, you might have heard. And he also wrote a follow-on book from that called Anti-Fragility. And there's some really good concepts in there about, um, so his claim to fame was that he predicted the uh, 08 market crash, right? And so in Anti-Fragility, he talks a lot about kind of threat modeling and how you, you, your, your system should be tested kind of frequently without any kind of plan for how they should be tested so that they're able to respond to the same idea behind the kind of simian army and chaos monkey stuff that Netflix does where they just randomly unplug uh, uh, services to see how they react to it and basically like bring down whole markets and stuff but then they're so quick to redeploy 
that that's how they actually test. So in my, in my view, um, and I'm trying to do a little more writing on this, over-testing a system um, builds fragility into it. So I see a lot of organizations that have big failures, even though they might run millions of tests, right? So they've got these giant unit test packs and they've got, they run you know, 400,000 tests on every commit and they still have some big production failures. And my view is that they're building fragility into the system by over-testing them. So the last one, an anti-pattern here, is that uh, trying to find efficiencies in testing actually decreases innovation in testing. Um, so raise your hand if you're, if you're doing any of these things, um, if your organization is trying to do these things, or you are. Um, shift left. Yeah, I hate that. Uh, shift left. Uh, if you've centralized testing, if you've decentralized testing, if you have a separate test team, if you push your testers back into the line, right? If you view testing as a role, yeah? Okay, so if you're doing any of those things, right, um, you're probably not gonna be very innovative in your approach to try and improve it. And I'll tell you why, and I have a very cynical view on this. Um, there's a, uh, I compare most test process improvement efforts I see at organizations to um, what is known as Sturgeon's Law, which is, uh, the Theodore uh, Sturgeon was a, a science fiction writer in the US, and basically the law is very simple, and it just says that 90% of everything is crap. Um, <laughs> and the way I see most quality or tester-led um, test process improvement um, initiatives work like this. So are you all familiar with the Three Stooges? Have you seen the Three Stooges at some point? Right, okay. Um, if not, go back and look at it. It's, 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 it's a show from, uh, I think, the 40s in the US, and they're these three idiot brothers, right? Um, so basically, and they're named Mo, Larry, and Curly, right? So Mo is supposedly the smart one. Larry, you know, I don't know what he's, if something's wrong with him, and then Curly's the very dumb one. So they're in a boat, and the boat starts to sink, all right? And Mo and Larry grab some buckets and a pitcher and start chucking water out of the boat. And Curly looks around, he can't find anything, so he finds an old hand drill, you know, the kind like this, right? So he's got his back to these guys, and he's over there, and he starts drilling holes in the bottom of the boat. Mo turns around, and he's like, what are you doing, you idiot? And he says, I'm making water letter outers, right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> That's how I see most test process improvement uh, initiatives when I go and look at the ones that, that testers or, or management have started. Um, because a lot of times testers um, can't see the forest for the trees, right? And there's a good element of kind of doctor heal thyself in this as well. And primarily because they're not business focused. They get straight into techniques and tools and start counting shit again and don't focus on, on the business. Um, they also tend to become technically obsessed, right? Uh, or as, again, my friend Michael Bolton calls it, you know, tool fetishes, right? Where we've got a tool that will fix everything and they would rather just sit at home or in their office playing with their tool than actually solving a problem. And as well, a lot of testers, in my experience, and as you know, uh, Ryan said, I go to every conference, um, you know, they don't study their craft, right? A lot of testers, don't know anything about testing, right? They don't know anything about the history of it, and they don't know kind of following the scientific method and how that can really help you apply good risk management to your business. So my advice, which I'm constantly banging on about of my two or three things that actually I've said, um, are you know, look, look for ways to align your test strategy to your business strategy. That will help you, and there's some lean kind of principles behind that, but it will help you eliminate a lot of waste out of your test strategy. As long, if you're aligning those two together, you won't be doing things that are unnecessary, right? And another thing is work with your business to kind of observe system behavior to ask questions that you hadn't thought of before, all right? Um, and I'll give you the kind of case study I'm working with an uh, organization right now to kind of get through. They did, um, uh, about a year and a half ago, some guy in management got the idea that you know, every tester has to code, right? So we're going down the automation route, and if you're gonna be a tester in this organization, you have to code. 
they went so far as to give a Java class to all their testers, and at the end, you couldn't meet their entry-level test for a Java programmer. Um, they let you go. They fired you. And um, because that's what the world needs is a bunch of more crappy Java developers, right? <laughs> I'm sure we all wake up wishing that happened. Um, and so now, a year down into their, their, uh, their journey on this, you get a call from them, and guess what? You know, they're still having big production problems. They haven't sped up at all. They're writing a bunch of automation that they can't understand and don't have any kind of real alignment to their strategy. And so now they're asking me to come in and do a test process <laughs> improvement review with them, which, you know, uh, I, not to get to the, the end before we even start, is going to look a lot like what I just told you. So, um, so that's the last one. So interestingly enough, I want to talk about a, a kind of analogous to this that the secret to testing efficiency, not ant efficiency, is idleness. So I read this article in the New York Times about ants and how they're so super efficient at tunnel digging, right? And so they, these, these scientists observed them for a while, and they found that no matter what they did, they, 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 they could take the best diggers out, put them somewhere else, they would still you know, somebody else would pick up the job. No matter what they did, they were, it was almost impossible for them to decrease the efficiency of how well ants are at uh, digging tunnels. And they also found that about, you know, 70% of the work was done by about 30% of the ants. Now, if you're doing any kind of job, you probably feel like that anyway, you're in that 30%. Um, but uh, that's one thing they found. And, and it wasn't that the ants that weren't digging were being lazy. They just, when a blocker came up, they either went idle or they focused on other things, right? So they didn't have this kind of convergence of people all trying to, you know, there might be something to, you know, when you're riding down the street and see a work crow, one guy's in the hole digging and everyone else is standing around watching. So there might be something to that. Um, but there was like a big, an unequal distribution of the digging work that they kind of self-managed. So, um, it got me thinking about how we kind of structure and manage testing and kind of allocate resources. And does, does anyone know what a cone is? K-O-A-N. So in kind of Buddhist philosophy, a cone is a kind of paradoxical question you can you think of when you're meditating and focus on that can hopefully, if you think about it enough, uh, you know, lead you to enlightenment, right? Um, so that's like the famous one is what's the sound of one hand clapping? Right, so you think about that for a while and meditate on it. It might bring you to enlightenment. So I want you to do a thought experience with me right now, okay? So I want everyone to close their eyes. Come on, close your eyes. And repeat with me. Om. Clear your mind. Om. Okay, now imagine yourself. You're a tiny ant. You're sitting in front of a computer. The keys are enormous because it's not a ant size computer, it's a normal size computer. Now repeat after me. 30% of my testing could cover 70% of my scope. Repeat with me. 30% oh. of my testing could cover 70% of my scope. Oh. All right, now, what, now we're back, thank you. I know we're not in California, I know we're in London, this doesn't really play here, but. Um, so <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that adding in idleness and time for exploration is probably gonna give you a much greater benefit than just trying to script everything to death. Um, and that thinking about your tests, right, actually factoring in time to think about your tests will probably yield you greater results than just, just running them um, because you know, checks do not equal tests, right? Functional checks are not tests, right? Um, so, in conclusion, everyone's favorite words when they're listening to a, a, a talk, um, stop trying to manage testing as though it can be solved, right? Manage risk associated to your business and let that guide where you test, not coming up with it the other way around. Um, secondly, if you want to speed up testing, do less of it, right? Repeat that with me. If you want to speed up testing, do less of it. Thank you. And allow for creativity and idleness 
in your test strategy or your test approach or, so that you get ideas, new test ideas. You can review the business and give time for exploration. Um, so with that, now you know. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll turn that off. <laughs> So uh, we got about about five to eight minutes of questions. If you want to ask Keith anything, it's funny you guys all thought that you were coming here Keith speak, but actually you got <laughs> inducted to the cult of Keith with repeating back to him That's right. the mummy and all that stuff. All right. Hi. Um, can Hi. you please elaborate on what you meant by over testing a system builds fragility? How how does that even work? So I think that relates a lot to what I see people doing from a regression perspective. So they're constantly checking to make sure they didn't make the same mistakes as opposed to trying to find new ones. And it's amazing the amount of effort that you people spend on regression. And that, that also um, kind of automated checks at commit are victim of the same problem. Right, so people, I see this mind shift now where, okay, well we had these giant functional regression tests we used to run through God knows whatever tool they were using to try and achieve shutter continuous testing. Um, so that, that model, I, be, I believe, I see, I see organizations who subscribe to that model, regardless of where it sits, still having big problems. Um, because they're not using that effort to check for new things as opposed to trying to make sure, oh, this shit still works. All right, if that makes sense. Uh, no, I was really fascinated by, by the last uh, one, uh, the, the, the idleness and the creativity. I, I can't repeat it anymore, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I was wondering, how does that look? How do you implement that? How do you make, uh, can, can you give an example? Yeah, you literally you take time away from your computer and go think about tests or go sit. When I, I was doing this as early as <coughs> years ago, I was working with UBS. We used to make the testers go sit with the traders, right? And I would just tell them, just shut up, watch what they're doing, and you know, come up with questions later we can try and answer. But just like observing system behavior, you know, you should be factoring that into you know your your strategy, you know. And uh, you always get the pushback of, you know, oh well, we can't do this here. You know, I'm not going to go to my boss and say, hey, I want to take 10% of my time to do nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I would say if you can't, um, if you can't scratch and claw 10% of your time on a weekly basis to do nothing, I mean, in a structured way, like try and think about, you know, I'm just asking you to go wander around, but you know, like think about your tests in a creative way. Um, one, I would say you're not accurately representing your time to your boss because everybody can get 10 minutes somewhere um, and that, that might not be a, the right place to work. Right, if, if they're not allowing you to be creative, um, that, and you can show some benefit to that, you know, that's, I, I literally just block out time to do it. Go for a walk, think about stuff. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? No? All right, thank you, Keith. Right. Thank you very much.